All right, ladies and gents, we are now going to do a little discussion previewing the upcoming Bank of Japan release that will be out tonight, and then we'll have a press conference from uh, Mr. Kuroda afterwards. And to help us do that, we're going to have event trader Gavin McGuire and chart trader Brett Manning. Good morning, gentlemen. What's up, Jim? How's it going? It's going well. Hey, Jim. How are you? I'm doing well. All right, Brett, I have a, a Nikkei chart for you. I have a Yen chart. Is there another chart that you would like me to prepare in for this discussion? Well, I'm guessing you're probably not going to have JGB futures, so uh, <laughs> probably... Do, do, they, do, do they trade on the CME by chance? No, they do not. So, yeah, yeah you, you can... Uh, people can queue up a... Uh, a chart of the the ten year, if they want. Um, I think there's a few places on the internet you can get it at different different websites that we don't probably want to uh, access for this purpose. But um, it's it's something people can find. Um, the key really will be about interest rates, the ten year specifically. Okay. So. All right. Well, I, I do have a yen and a Nikkei, if that helps. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so I mean, just to give, I mean, basically what Brett and I are just trying to do here is, uh, you know, I think there's been a lot of talk about the Bank of Japan being uh, important, and really there hasn't been a lot of clarity on why it's important. So um, I, I think the primary reason, Brett, I don't know if you'd agree with me on this, is just the sentiment around global central banking and which direction we're going. I think first and foremost that is the primary um, thing that we're going to be taking a look at. Over, overall the operational changes if they do occur I don't think that they would have much of an impact per se on the average trader uh, trading uh, equities in the U.S., but uh, there are a couple of knock-on effects that we've been seeing over the last couple of weeks, um, and I think that's what we're trying to take a look at. Brett, would you agree with me there? Is there anything you'd want to add? or No, I mean, I think you're capturing the, the issue, and that is that Japan has been kind of the last anchor of the idea of a world where we have perpetually accommodative monetary policy and, and to historic levels. And if we finally see, we've already kind of got a sense that Europe on some level is heading toward some kind of at least attempt at normalization. And even if that's a really long drawn out process without a lot of concrete steps, that's the, the direction of the, the, the situation in Europe, and it's certainly the direction of the situation in most places around the world, and Japan has kind of been, you know, as, as one would possibly assume, given the demographics of the situation there, that they're sort of the last holdout for this cycle in moving in that direction, and so it's a real statement if they start to tighten. And I think that um, that kind of, you know, that, that kind of sense and the sentiment around global central banking in general, and if we're still living in a period where everything is is anchored to extremely accommodative monetary policy that they're they kind of symbolic there so yeah yeah and and i mean you know we've, we've seen it with uh europe where they've uh started tapering their purchases of course and they are talking about raising rates at the end of the summer in 2019 bank of england is another one where we've seen uh you know uh, their chief economist andy haldane had switched over to the hawkish camp and now we're kind of looking at about a 50 50 potentially for a 25 basis point hike in england so um you know we're just seeing this across the board but as brett noted noted uh bank of japan is certainly a key one given they've arguably had the most aggressive monetary policy out there in terms of easing. Uh, Brett, I'm just going to give them a little bit of background on why this meeting kind of fell onto the radar. And sure. what, what happened was in June, when the Bank of Japan released their summary of opinions, there was a growing concern about some of the side effects from their ultra-easing policy. Um, you know, you know, if you are looking for equities to be able to trade on this, Japanese banks should be a winner here. You could see, like, say, a Mitsubishi, Jim, if you're able to pull up MUFG, because one of the side effects, of course, has been Japanese bank earnings just being decimated by these low rates for being around as long as they have. And that kind of started to raise the flag for why this July meeting is going to be so important. And uh, September... 
Now, obviously, if they brought this up in June, it would seem pretty quickly for them to move in July because a lot of the comments were around looking to study some of the side effects. However, uh, in, around the September meeting, there will be some elections going on, which basically has the bank looking to avoid trying to politicize this decision and moving, moving it a little bit forward rather than waiting towards that uh, November meeting. So that's kind of why this July uh, meeting has fallen directly onto the radars for a lot of traders. Uh, Brett, do you want me to go through some of the different mechanics, or did you want to address that in terms of what they're discussing possibly changing? Go for it. Uh, so basically, as uh, Brett was talking about, the 10-year is a key area for the Bank of Japan. Um, they've basically had a process, um, you know, kind of a, their operation twist um, where they are trying to peg that 10-year yield down to around 0%. Now, they have a cap at 10 basis points, so it, so it could rise up. Um, you know, m most recently they conducted a 10-year uh, rate purchase operation at 11 basis points. This would have been on July 23rd, and then 10 basis points on the 27th. So it's been bumping around the upper end of that um, bar that they have. And what that basically does is that raises the interest rates around the globe, and you've been seeing that with a lot of bond selling in response to the higher to the higher yields going up, um, you know, the inverse relationship there, and that's really been one of the key reasons why we've been seeing financials performing so well on this idea of a global interest rate rise. So one of the aspects that the Bank of Japan is talking about is relaxing the target on this. Um, which is basically they'd be per potentially purchasing less bonds to um, try to uh, force down that interest rate yield on the 10-year. The other thing that is being discussed is uh, the bank also purchases a lot of ETFs, and what they're talking about is changing around the targets on the on uh, what they're purchasing there in the ETFs, um, which is something uh, you, you know they're not looking at reducing what they're looking to purchase on the ETF side, but changing around um, what they'd be targeting, and they are kind of the two monetary instruments that people are going to be keeping an eye out on most. Of course, one of the side issues here for the Bank of Japan is their inability to really see any sort of rise in their inflation. Uh, some of the inflation data that they had come out recently for the Tokyo and um, the uh, nation, and uh, it was the Tokyo that came in, I'm just taking a look for that, at, I think it was plus 0.8%, which was a little bit of an acceleration, and the core was up at uh, plus 0.5%. But as you can see, this was well below expectations. This is bringing some doubt into the bank moving. And then the nationwide CPI actually contracted, or uh, rose only 0.2% year over year. So another area that we're going to want to keep an eye out on is the bank's 2018-19 CPI forecast. Um, Currently, uh, the April forecast had core CPI at plus 1.3% in 2018. We have not seen that. So it's possible that they could downgrade this inflation forecast and still tweak. But Brett, with that on the table, um, what do you think would be the most aggressive steps we could see from the Bank of Japan? Um, what do you think the, is the base case scenario? And what do you think some of the fallout on this could be in terms of market reaction? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think that this third question is related to the first question. So um, I, I think that they're probably hard at work trying to analyze how far away uh, they really are in terms of where the interest rate wants to be. Because if you can imagine, let's just say, so they're, they're, they've got a finger on the scale at the long end of the curve. And that's a very, very rare situation to actually target a particular interest rate. You can do purchases. And, and and just you know soak up supply and take it off uh, out of out of second market supply, but if you are actually targeting an interest rate, you're making it your primary instrument. Then, as far as I know, this is the first time maybe that's ever been done. Although there may have been something back in during I think World War II where there was something kind of similar done, but I think yeah, I that I haven't um, come across it. So 
Yeah. So I think that this is a it's a really strange thing. There's not they they don't have history books to rely on. They don't have other experts around the world that have dealt with this sort of thing to consult with. They have to figure out how to manage this process. And what they're doing is they're pinning the ten year rate uh, to a particular level, and um, they've been doing it for a couple of years now, close to almost two years. And um, you know, as they as they start to try to move out of that. To understand what the risks are of that really will dictate how aggressive they can be. And the only way to understand the risks, I think, is to understand where the rates would be if they didn't have their finger on the scale. That's a counterfactual. You have no idea. Obviously, everything you do affects the context that you're in. There's no real way to know for certain. But it, would, it would certainly be just throwing a dart at a, at a number, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, but there is a number, right? I mean, if they were to just yeah. end their process right this second, it would go somewhere. And that somewhere would represent, you know, some approximation of where, you know, interest rates sort of want to be. And it just depends on how far away that is because um, there's, you know, there's there's two elements here. One is um, where interest rates are. That's important. It's important. It affects um, all sorts of things in the economy, where, where the price of money is on that time frame. But there's another factor, which is the volatility of interest rates. And that's almost more important. And if... Um, if they let it go too far too fast, they can so they can control for the volatility of interest rates. If they're looking to gradually normalize policy, then you know to some extent you can say they can't control where interest rates are going to be, but they can control the rapidity with which they make that shift. And I, I would imagine that there's no way they're going to make any major move today because um, they're just starting to send out trial balloons. And I think you're right in saying that you know the July. Is, is the testing ground for the headlines to see how markets start to react to that idea being floated out there. They may make a gesture of talking see, see, about I, the I process. Think, I, I think that with what they've got on the board here, Brett, at the very least, don't you think that they could kind of say, we're going to expand the band on which we allow this to move and then use that as a trial? Yes. I, I, yes. So that's what I was kind of getting to, right? So okay. they're not going to. Um, so I meant when I when I said they were not going to do anything dramatic. I meant they're not going to um, shift away from you know curve control as they call right. it. Right. Um, they're going to probably just like we we when we talked the other day. I said it's kind of like loosening your grip on the beach ball that you're holding underwater, and you know it's going to move a bit, and they're going to try to gauge based on that feedback mechanism just how gradual a process this needs to be and how many steps it needs to take if if they were to see a reason to normalize completely, which I'm kind of leaning against based on the data that we've seen, that they're going to see a situation anytime soon where they're going to find monetary justification to normalize when, when completely. When you say based on the data, are you talking just pretty much inflation data or just all around? All around, but inflation, yeah. sure. Just the, you okay. know, I mean, they they kind of had another one of these processes where they get all you know. Japan has gone through this so many times over the last few years, and even really sort of over the last few decades, of just kind of like, you know, the idea that the animal spirits are going, that they've got a self-reinforcing uh, feedback loop that is headed in the direction of things heating up, including inflation and and general economic growth, and then it kind of fizzles. And and every time they seem to you know, kind of remove monetary tools and then have to put them back on, and um, I've likened it to trying to start up a lawnmower with a with a rip cord, you know, pull the pull cord to try and start it up, and it's kind of like mowing a whole lawn just by pulling that cord and walking around rather than having the engine ever catch and start up, and that's kind of been the story for Japan in terms of monetary policy and, and economics for a long time, and um, and they're trying to. You know, they're kind of on the verge of, I think, that same experience again, um, because they've started to just even talk about it, and and things have started to pull back. So, I, I don't know about you, but I I, I kind of doubt they're going to see cause to to fully normalize policy. Yeah, no, I I, I agree with you there. I I think that it's low hanging fruit for them to say that they'll expand. Um, the allowance for the tenure to yield because at the end of the day, no one really knows what that means. <laughs> it, 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 it's it's kind of like when yeah. uh, China with the yuan, like you know, expands the trading range. Yes, for it. And, uh, right. It's like okay, seemingly but, committal, okay. but really non-committal language. Yeah, yeah, and like you said, that's a further trial balloon. I do think that they will move forward with that because again, but then you know, it's going to kind of fly in the face if we see a lower. Um, 
outlook for their uh, inflation target, you know, for, for their forecast. So it'll, it would kind of be like, well, why are you tightening if you don't see inflation coming? I don't think that they do anything with those ETF changes. I think that that would add a little too much uncertainty to the markets, and I don't think that they want to press that button just yet. So, again, I just think that they go in and they look to adjust um, – the band for it. Now, there is a 10-year bond auction uh, for Japan on August 2nd, so we should get a pretty quick look at, um, you know, some of the potential changes, I guess, to their policy. But o overall, I think that they're just looking, like you said, to float that trial balloon and do the bare minimum and do something that's really not um, quantitative that could be uh, measured. So, yeah, I think um, that they need more information to understand how many steps are involved in the theoretical or hypothetical process of full normalization. They need to be able to map that out because it's it's a high risk proposition, given um, you know given given the fact that this is sort of that they're in kind of untested, uncharted waters. Right. So I mean, and you know, if you're trying to follow this at home. Um, you know, I think the MUFG, uh, the Mitsubishi ETF that or uh, bank that I was talking about earlier, that's probably a good proxy for you to just kind of follow along and to get a gauge on how aggressive they'd be. Because we start seeing uh, the Japanese banks pull in a little bit, you'll you'll get the feeling that uh, the market just kind of moved on from this being a relative non-event. Um, I, I don't know what. Um, Fred, obviously, I, uh, you know, now I'm, I'm just saying that for uh, more of the equity traders that are just kind of following this as a backdrop. But as someone um, a little bit more in tune on the fixed income side, um, what side effects are you just going to kind of be watching? What charts will you be watching, Brett, just to gauge the market's uh, temperature on how they're uh, reviewing whatever the bank decides tonight? Well, I mean, everything will come off of the ten-year. And right now we're actually uh, 10 basis points, so it is it's moving higher. It's moved higher over the last few days, and it's at the top of a range going back. Basically, it's testing the range highs for really more than two years and almost three years, two and a half years. So it, it's it's it, you know it's been kept in an extremely tight range because it's exactly what they've been pinning. But they've really been pinning it between 0% and 0.1%. And it is right at 0.1% right now. Um, and, you know, that's kind of... Which is their goal, right? E well, that, that was their goal. But it, the fact that it's moved up to the top of that range and is pressing against it is the market kind of hedging for the possibility of, like we talked about, that that range has shifted. Um, and, you know, that's, that is... Obviously, that's going to have a number of different... Uh, effects on psychology and I mean more directly as you pointed out in terms of net interest margin for Japanese banks um, but yeah I mean that's that's the chart and then you know let's just say volatility in interest rates is an important thing in its own right and if they do let's just say there's a number of different cases here one of them would be that they're more aggressive than we're expecting in that case I would expect probably um, you know, highly volatile rates in Japan. Markets don't move according to nominal levels. They move according to um, a couple of different processes in my experience. And one of them is the volatility, the, the rate of change of something. But another is actually um, as, as something becomes fixed into place in a very predictable and tight way for a long period of time, you can kind of imagine a whole ecosystem evolving around that. So like one of the ways I think about it, and hopefully this isn't a bridge too far conversationally and tangentially, but one of the ways I think about this is if you think of like, um, there, there are different uh, ecosystems that are based around salinity in the water. And um, if you look at like an estuary or tide pool area, the salinity is constantly changing. And the types of life that grow there grow based on being able to be very flexible in terms of how much salt is in the water. But there are other areas, if you think of like a mountaintop lake, that's just never got any salt in the water. Um, and, and the type of life that grows around that gets very fixed around a certain 
kind of relationship with what that level of that is going to be. And whole different ecosystems come into place and evolve over millions of years around this assumption. And if you suddenly change that salt level, that will have a much greater impact on that type of system than a system like an estuary. So when you look at a financial market, I think the same kind of thing happens. When something comes in and it sets a particular factor at a very predictable level and it stays that way for a long time, it's it's very difficult to predict what sorts of collateral impacts are going to you know, reveal themselves in other financial markets when you suddenly change that thing. Because people make financial decisions and they coordinate lots of different financial relationships all around the world based on what Japanese long-term interest rates are. And when they become very fixed and very concrete, um, and, and very predictable, then long-range decisions are put into place as people acclimate to that. And when you start to change something that has been relatively unchanged for a very long period of time, it can have a lot of unexpected effects, and it can really change a lot of things that you don't see coming in the first place. So I would say if they get more aggressive than we're expecting, I would imagine um, it will have a bigger impact. It will become a bigger story than most people realize because it's it's such a central market for the global financial landscape that, that when you change, it's been so fixed for so long that when you suddenly start to change it, it can have a lot of very unexpected results. Uh, well, one of the creatures obviously uh, running around in this in this lake would be the carry trade people, right? But um, where, where, where do you do you think, I mean, obviously it's not online with uh, the 2007 level, but uh, certainly there's people leveraged up on this carry trade. Uh, you know, it could be really showing a little bit in the NASDAQ sell-off and some of the growth names that we're seeing pull back in. Um, where do you gauge, and I, I know this is a pretty difficult question, where do you gauge like the carry trade in terms of its impact on the markets at the moment? Do you, do you think that there's still a pretty significant exposure there? Um, because that's obviously what yes. also gets disrupted on that. So you, you think it's around the 2007 levels? I think that it could be bigger, but it's not necessarily just yen-based because you've got euro and yen financing rates that have been kept down. So we've had two cycles. The United States has been on one cycle. Europe and Japan have been on a different cycle. If you just look at the baton of QE, we, we started normalizing in 2014. ECB started doing their QE in 2015. I think there's been kind of this sense that the U.S. has been on a different time frame in terms of its cycle. And I think when you get that staggered like that, you get assets really outperforming and growth happening over here and really, really cheap money in Europe and Japan persistently so, fixed in place by central bank action. And I think when you get that, they're making a market for people building up leverage over here. So I think probably what we've seen is a bigger phenomenon maybe than in 2007 in terms of people using cross-border uh, uh, fixed rates of financing to build leverage. So people borrowing money in Japan and in Europe and buying, using that for leveraged speculation in the United States. I think that's probably, it just stands to reason to me that that would be bigger now maybe than ever before. But again, I think that's one of these sorts of things that I think central banks probably are thinking quite a lot about. Like, yeah. I don't think that that's necessarily a terribly bearish argument because I think they're probably aware of that. And so that may in fact keep borrowing costs low, lower for longer just because they're so afraid of rocking the boat everywhere else. So I think that, um, yeah, I think that, that you know, and, and if they give plenty of notice, I don't think it's an Armageddon scenario at any point necessarily. I think if they, they do a good job of communications, they make it a very gradual process. People gradually acclimate to a different kind of arrangement. It would impact things because you're drawing leverage out of the system, but not necessarily something that you can't, you know, beat with enough growth. I mean, it may, may, it may actually lead to a situation where what we see is one of those very predictable cyclical ideas of, you know, all of the asset growth happens before the real growth. And in a lot of places, you may see growth pick up and assets not respond that well. And this is just because we're kind of evening out the score. You know, the financing is not quite as easy. There's not as much new speculation, but the growth is gradually picking up the, the slack. And you just end up with a, a big, wide-range lateral consolidation in things for a while. All right. Well, I, Brett, is there anything you want to add at this point? I mean, I think we've addressed the main issues. We, we'll, we've given the amount of central banks uh, meeting this week. I know the Fed should be a relative non-event, but um, I think me and you will probably plan on doing a couple of comments on central banks 
for people, but um, in this subject, do you have anything else to add? No, I mean, I think that just basically that this, you know, we're talking about it now because it could be a more important factor than it may at first appear. It may not. Exactly. You know, it, it may not be that big a deal, but it just, you know, have it, have an understanding that there could be a lot of interesting and strange effects. correlation effects that, that yeah, that a lot of pin action, so to speak, on a macro level that, um, that you know, just appreciate the possibility of that and, and, and you know, pay attention to what they say because um, cause this could be a more important factor than maybe, you know, it's been built up to be. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, hey, Brett, always great talking to you about this. And like I said, we'll do some follow-ups with people uh, because I, I think that this is um, probably the biggest week we have until we run into the fall because I think this really sets the narrative for certainly the month of August and perhaps into September and October. So, um, you, know, you know, we're going to want to continue to follow this story. But, uh, Brett, I will uh, be talking to you, and we'll figure out, you know, what we could do is a quick follow-up tomorrow for people just to let people know what happened and uh, certainly take a look out at the Fed and the Bank of England and uh, the other ones coming up this week to see if anything big uh, runs out from those meetings. Sure, you got it, Gav. Okay, take care, but talk to you soon. Okay.